the royal titles of Jesus, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. And let's just dive right in. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah was prophesying to God's people during dark and gloomy days. He spoke 700 years before Christ at a time when both Judah in the south and Israel's ten tribes in the north were not living for God. There was going to be judgment coming, first to the northern tribes and then eventually to the southern kingdom as well. The Assyrians were a brutal and conquering people. Maybe you remember the description of them from our study in Jonah in the summer. They will come, as Isaiah predicted, like a rod in God's hands, and as God will even bring this consequence toward his people, they will face the consequences of their backsliding for centuries. So these are days of gloom. The threat is looming. The, the armies are assembling and ready to attack. But Isaiah also says in chapter 9 that God is merciful. Even in pronouncing judgment, God will show mercy to those who call out to him. Now they must reap the consequences of their sin, but even then God will show mercy. The southern kingdom of Judah will be delivered in Isaiah's day from the Assyrians by the prayers of Hezekiah and the prayers of Isaiah. So there will be mercy, especially to Judah, a little more time before the judgment comes. But even more than the deliverance through Hezekiah, Isaiah is foretelling the deliverance, the ultimate deliverance, and the ultimate mercy and hope that will come through the Messiah when he comes to deliver his people and to reign as the king on the throne of David. God will send a light to those who are in darkness. And we know what his name is. His name is Jesus. He is the greatest hope that God will give to his people. It's that of the Messiah. And the greatest hope that we have today in our world is to put our faith and our hope in Jesus. Even though judgment is coming and days are going to get darker on this world, on this earth, there is still time to repent. And we can still receive his mercy and be fully forgiven and get right with God. In fact, we need to. So we pick it up in verse 6 in that tone, in that context. Speaking of Israel's ultimate hope in their Messiah, verse 6 says, Unto us, a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now, before we get down to the five royal titles at the second half of verse 6, let's just take a moment to look at the first half of the verse. As Isaiah describes Jesus' nature, and we see there are actually two natures of Jesus in one verse. A child is born, Jesus is absolutely human, a son is given, Jesus is absolutely divine, the Son of God, God with us, God given from heaven. And this verse is saying two things, that the humanity of Christ had a beginning point, and yet the deity of Christ is eternal. He was both born in a human body and placed in a manger and yet at the same time, he was given from heaven from eternity. So let's just break that down a little more. For unto us a child is born shows us the Bethlehem scene of the nativity. That Jesus became fully human, weak, fully dependent on his parents. Crazy. Think about this. God in a womb. God being delivered, God being born a human. John 1 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is the incarnation. That is God with us. That God became flesh. Jesus could have come down to us 
and only appeared like a man. Like he did in the Old Testament many times to Abraham, to Jacob, to Joshua, and to others. Or Jesus could have come down in a real human body that was already 30 years old. Adam, remember, was created fully mature. So why didn't God just create for Jesus, who is called the second Adam, a human body that was already fully mature, and he just come down and, you know, come on Good Friday and die on the cross and call it a weekend job and then rise again on Sunday? Because God wanted to completely identify with us in our humanity. Jesus knows our every weakness, our every struggle, and our pain in every way. Jesus not only made us, but even became one of us and experienced life in the fullest way. He was a baby. He was a two-year-old. He was a boy. He learned to read and to write. He learned how to work in his father's shop to look after and help his family. He went through the preteen years and the junior high days. He got his first pimple on his nose and was laughed at by the other kids. He went through it all growing up through every kind of human weakness and experience of pain and struggle. He had parents. He had brothers. He had sisters. When you read the four Gospels, there were times when Jesus was sleepy, when he was exhausted, when he was tempted, when he was hungry, when he was grieving, when he was weeping, betrayed, tortured very painfully, and he experienced death. He can relate to all of us. He put aside his great glory and power and chose to walk as a human. He chose to be fully dependent on prayer and on his Father to speak to him and to lead him, on the Holy Spirit to empower him, kind of like he calls us to be fully dependent on God. Jesus lived in that weakness and humanity. Yet all that time, he was not just any child or any boy or any man. He never sinned. He was perfectly holy and pure. He was always God with skin on. Notice the second half there of that first verse section. It says, unto us a son is given. That means he was divine, given from heaven. This is God's love, that he gave his son. We saw in Genesis that Jesus was very involved in the creation of the world. Colossians chapter 1 says that by Jesus all things were created that are in heaven and earth. Jesus himself said in John chapter 17 that he shared the glory of the Father with the Father before the foundation of the world. In John 17 verse 5 it says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Jesus himself did not begin at the manger scene. He was born there, but he was also given from heaven. His human tent had a beginning, but Jesus is truly the eternal Son of God. And it says there, the government will be upon his shoulder. This is speaking of Jesus' sovereignty, that he will reign over the world. In the first half of the verse, we saw Jesus' humanity and his deity, and now we see his sovereignty. Isaiah is looking way ahead, past Bethlehem, to the future rule of Christ. Up until now, the government has been upon man's shoulder, and even to our day is still on man's shoulder. But soon it will be on Jesus' shoulder. The government on his shoulder. In those days, they saw the government as a burden, and they placed a robe on a new king's shoulders. Sometimes we think of our shoulders in the sense of a burden. Can so-and-so shoulder the weight of their responsibility? Can I shoulder all of these things in my life? The old story is of a king who wanted to rule his people well, and he decided to take off his robe and disguise himself as a peasant two times a year and walk amongst the people 
and rub shoulders with them in the markets without any security or hint of his royalty. His, adv- his advisors tried to persuade him not to risk his life like that, but he said, I cannot rule my people unless I know how they live. So Jesus came and became one of us for 33 years in a similar way. And because he now has served us and selflessly died for us, he will be the perfect ruler one day. He will carry all the full weight of leadership of the whole world upon his shoulders. We won't just be, or he won't just be a front man for the cameras or a figurehead in a complex organization. He himself will be the entire government. He'll be the best leader this world has ever had. And that's why we often say, come Quickly, Lord Jesus, come. Maranatha. It says there, the son who is given from heaven will reign. You guys, in his first coming, Jesus came as the suffering servant. In Jesus' second coming, he will come as king. One day, when he comes back the second time, he will clean up all the sin in the world. He will defeat the armies of the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon. And he will take his rightful seat on the throne in Jerusalem and rule over the whole world. And in that day, the government will truly be on his shoulder. Jesus, he is the king. He is humanity, deity, and sovereignty. That's the first half of the verse there. But let's now look at the second half of the verse. Verse 6 talks about his attributes, his character both now in heaven, but also one day when he's ruling on earth and and even in our own hearts right now, we can apply these royal titles of the Messiah. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, in the Bible, names express nature and character more than perhaps our names today. Our names sometimes have meaning but usually it's quite, quite a small meaning. We know that when the Bible gives names, they have a lot of depth regarding the nature and the character of the person. And as far as we know, nobody actually called Jesus by these names when he was here on earth the first time. So it's not so much the title of the name, but it's the meaning that is significant. And one day, I'm sure these names will be emblazoned on banners in the new future kingdom in the new Jerusalem one day. These names will be spoken and and called, and there'll be so much more depth and meaning realized than, than I can present to you today. But it says it right here, so let's talk about what it means. First one, wonderful. Now, some Bible translations have no comma between wonderful and counselor. Both ways are true of Jesus. He is wonderful, He is counselor, and he's also a wonderful counselor. So don't get hung up on the comma. Whether your Bible adds one or not, both ways are true. He's wonderful as a noun, and he's also wonderful as the adjective of a counselor. Now, when I studied it, and I'm not a, a master at Hebrew, but the New King James does put a comma between wonderful and counselor, and the word wonderful appears to me to be a noun. So I'm going, for the purposes of that today, to separate Wonderful and Counselor as different titles. But you can't really separate them in thought completely because the Hebrew language is not like the New Testament Greek where it's very defined and specific. The Hebrew language is a lot more thought for thought. So you can't, even if they're separate nouns, they they go together. Jesus is truly wonderful. Let's talk about that. He's wonderful. In our dark world... We truly need someone to inspire us again with truth and with awe. Jesus inspires awe in us when we place our eyes on him. Psalm 77 verse 14 says, You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. You guys, when we're really looking at Jesus, we can never be bored. We can never be finding that we're losing steam because he fills us with wonder. Mary said it like this, he who is mighty has done great things, wonder-inspiring things for me, and holy is his name. 
You guys, he's worthy of our awe and our praise. He made himself of no reputation, even though he was equal with God. And he became like one of us, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You guys, Jesus did all this for us. And it's a finished work. When he hung on the tree, he said, it is finished, paid in full. All your sin, all your shame is dealt with by me. And it's gone, paid for. Your debt is gone. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's from Philippians 2. You see, he deserves our knee to be bowed, our tongue to confess for all that he has done for us. You guys, in our world, we are very quick to give glory to men and women, to exalt and praise people for their skills, for their art, for their hard work, for their talents. And there's nothing wrong with encouraging people, but there is something wrong when we idolize men and women and make them our heroes or give them glory. But you guys, we cannot exaggerate our estimation of Jesus. He alone is worthy. He's the only one who could die for our sins. No one else could do that. No one else could even help him. It says in Hebrews 1, when he himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He by himself purged our sins. No one can even assist him. But he did it all for us. So how do we personally relate to this title? Wonderful, wonderful one. Well, the question I have for you is what do you think about first thing in the morning when you wake up? What do you fill your mind with? In Philippians, it says, finally, brethren, Philippians 4, 8, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, I want you to think of Jesus. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue or anything praiseworthy, meditate on Jesus. Put him first in your day. And when we turn our eyes onto him, we're filled with that wonder, that sense of awe, and we give him glory, and there is fulfillment in praising him because that's what we were made to do. You guys, I've been thinking a bit about Boxing Day yesterday and the temptation with my smartphone while I'm at home spending the day studying, preparing to just quickly go on to different websites and stores and Amazon and all those things and see what's for sale today. I can't go to the store today, but what, what's on there? And, and the temptation continually to go back toward consumerism and look for fulfillment in finding a deal, in getting some material object. I didn't end up buying anything. But you know what? Rather, it's better to be in awe of Jesus. And that's what the Lord was convicting me about. It's not wrong to buy something in the January sale. I think Megan bought a nice little, you know, magic bullet spinning, you know, blender so we can make smoothies. Like, great, we got a deal. But our heart can easily draw towards stuff. And it never satisfies. Make sure you're focused on Jesus and the wonder. You'll see him as wonderful. And you'll know that pure joy of being in awe of him. We've been studying creation. I'm in awe of his creative power. I'm in awe of Jesus' ministry, of his healing, of his teaching, of his work on the cross, of his resurrection. There's so much in here that we can easily find awe if we open up the word of God first thing in the day. He saved me. He's filled me. He's removed my sin. He's called me. He's working through me. You guys, there's a lot of negatives in our world and maybe in our lives, but there's so much positive in Jesus. Focus on him. And the more we see him, the more in awe we shall be. The second name 
is counselor. Don't we all need someone to help us in life? Jesus is the one who truly can help us with all of our problems. He designed us, created us, and knows everything about us. Imagine for a moment a special counseling office in Regina with a counselor who always gives perfect counsel. And before you walk in, he already knows absolutely everything about you and everything about the issues you're working through. That counseling office does not exist in Regina, but you do not need one because his name is Jesus. And you do not have to book an appointment to meet with him in some office to receive his counsel. Now, I'm not saying all counseling is, is without value. There obviously is when the Lord uses someone who understands scripture to help us understand things. But I want to encourage you first, your main counselor is Jesus. And he wants you to go to him. Listen to how much he knows you out of Psalm 139. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. The psalmist said, how precious also are your thoughts toward me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I could count them, they're more in number than the sand. And when I awake, I'm still with you. He's better than a human counselor because he is always with us. And he knows everything about us. In John 2, it says Jesus knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Colossians 2 verse 3 also says, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Anyone can give advice, but there is no one as wise, no one who gives as perfect counsel as Jesus does. Are we listening to him? Psalm 119 says, his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. He alone is the living word made flesh, and this book alone is the written word of God put into human language. Stick with Jesus and your Bible, and you will have all the wisdom you need. You guys, this is the time of year when people begin thinking about goal setting for the new year. How about setting some spiritual goals? Pray about them. What, what should I make my spiritual goals? Don't ask me. Ask your counselor. Ask the Lord. What areas does the Lord want you to grow in? In your faith? In your walk? In your relationships? What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Pray and seek him and ask, what are the goals you have for me this year? I would say top of that list is to reset that goal of reading God's word daily in 2021. You'll find all the wisdom you need, and you'll get to know your counselor in a deep, deep way. You say, well, how do I get counsel from heaven when I read the Bible? Well, there's really three steps to it. If you want to jot these down, seek, listen, and do. First, seek him. Seek him in the word of God. He teaches the humble what is right, and he teaches them in their way. His word will, will minister to you. Are you seeking the Lord? But also listen. Take the time to be in the quiet and to pour out your heart and to listen to the voice of the Lord. And ask him direct questions and let his Holy Spirit speak to you in accordance with the word. The psalmist also prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxiety. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So seek him, listen to him, and thirdly, start doing. You guys, Jesus will stop giving counsel when we stop doing what he's already told us to do. The tap will shut off because he doesn't want to cause a flood if the drain is clogged. And the drain is doing. It's getting his word out flowing through our life. And then he'll pour in more. 
he'll pour in more when we're doing. John 13, after washing the disciples' feet, Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. God, why are you not helping me when I pray? Why are my problems not getting better? Well, ask yourself the question, are you doing everything he has told you to do that you know you should do? And then as you're doing, he'll reveal the next part of his plan, of his wisdom in your life. Jesus ended the Sermon on the Mount with these words, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. But he also said, those who hear these sayings of mine and do not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. You guys, Jesus is the perfect and the wonderful counselor. He wants to be the one speaking, but we need to be the ones doing and responding. And when that is there, the flow of his counsel will keep pouring in Number three, his name shall be called Mighty God. He was fully human and fully God. We established that already. In fact, only two chapters before, in 7 verse 14, he's described as Emmanuel, God with us. Now, this is really important. Most cults and false religions will revere Jesus. And they'll even love Jesus. Jesus, and we can get drawn in easily because they do seem to hold Jesus in high esteem. But they only seem to. They do not hold him high enough. When it comes down to it, most cults categorically deny that Jesus is God. And that is the problem. Oh, they might say, Jesus is great. Come to Jesus. Jesus is your Savior. It's not what they say that's wrong. It's what they're not saying that we've got to listen for. Hold on. Who is Jesus? Is he God? And if they don't say yes, if they don't affirm mighty God, then they're a cult. And they're out to deceive you and present a false Jesus. Who is this mighty God? It's the child who's born, the son who's given. His name shall be mighty God. You cannot get away from this. It's so clear. In fact, there are so many verses. I can think of probably 50 different verses as clear as this one that show us that Jesus is God. You have to change the Bible and change the words in it, like the different translations that are used in order to try and get away with it. But we know that he is God. Matthew 1.23 Remember what Gabriel said? Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Now, because Jesus is God, this is what it means. When he gives counsel, it's not only good counsel, but he gives us the power to do it. <laughs> this is the great application he not only tells us what to do, but he is the power and the source to transform us. Jesus' counsel is not just reform your life, it's let me transform your life. He doesn't just tell us to clean up our old life, he invites us to give our whole life to him and let him change us from the inside out. He's the wonderful counselor who is also mighty God. Like we sang today, yet not I, but Christ through me. But through Christ in me. That is how it works as a Christian. We not only look at him as God, but we allow him to transform us from the inside out. We don't just hear his counsel, we let him help us to do it. He doesn't just diagnose our problems and explain them. He helps us with the solution. And that is often the shortcoming of human counselors, by the way. They often can point out the problem and point out the reasons for the problem. But it's only Jesus who can actually help us with the solution. And his diagnosis is the best as well. 
the fourth name, Everlasting Father. Now, this is not to be confused with the Father himself. This is not saying Jesus is the exact same person as the Father, but rather it's saying he is the source of eternal life. Well, the Father of eternity was probably the, the most clear way to translate that. Now, he is like a father in the sense that he is one with his father. He did not become God. He always was God. He was God pre-Bethlehem, pre-New Testament, pre-Garden of Eden, pre-creation and pre-time. Like we've been studying in Genesis, especially on Thursday nights in our in-depth studies, he was God the Son in heaven. He is eternal and eternal. He is the father or the source of all eternal life. He's the father of eternity, the father of eternal life, the source. And it says in Hebrews chapter 1, speaking of how he will be the father to Israel over the future kingdom age, it says, but to the son, he, the father, says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, that's Jesus, your God, that's the Father, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than all your companions. That's Hebrews 1, 8 and 9. Speaking of how he will be the Father over the kingdom ages to come, the source of life, the source of eternal life. He's the Father of eternity. And you guys, to us, that means he's our source of life. He's our good shepherd, looking after us and strengthening us. And the fifth title here is Prince of Peace. So, when Jesus came the first time, he was on top of the Mount of Olives. And he rode in to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on a donkey. The donkey symbolized peace terms being made by a king. So they called him Prince of Peace. They bowed down to him. They brought those palm branches out and yet he did not rule and reign it was a future prophecy coming as a foretaste of coming attractions and when he comes the second time he will rule as the prince of peace and we know that in order to do that he has to wipe out sin and wipe out the devil and the antichrist who will rule over this world and the nations who come against God and his people in Israel In Revelation 19, it talks about this, that he will come again to Jerusalem, not riding on a donkey, but riding on a white horse. It's also in the book of Zechariah. Why? Because he will judge and make war. Why will he do that? Because he will return to this world in the middle of a worldwide conflict. And that is when he comes to beat their swords into plowshares and beat their spears into pruning hooks when he puts an end to Armageddon's nations that will no longer make war anymore. And Jesus will set up his true kingdom of peace. That's what's coming. You guys, the angels came to the shepherds on that day, and they said, he's being born. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. Now, that may seem a little awkward, Why did the angels say he came to bring peace on earth when we've just had wars after wars after wars? I looked up some stats. This year in 2020, of course, was 75 years since World War II. We've been without a global war for a long time. But did you know that the world is still full of smaller but very brutal wars? In 2020, there were 90, 90 wars or deadly conflicts around the world. 64 of those had over 100 deaths. Many of them had thousands of deaths, like war in Afghanistan, Syria, and Yemen, some having in the range of 20,000 people killed this year. Overall, tens of thousands around the world die of war every year. So what does this mean? that the angel said, here he comes to bring peace on earth. How does that work? You guys, Jesus, here's how it works. He is the prince of peace. The word prince means ruler or captain. 
He is the Prince of Peace, and he brings peace to all who make him their king. Wherever Jesus is crowned king, there will be peace. The truth is, this world has not yet crowned Jesus as king. So globally, politically, there is no peace that is lasting. However, peace comes to every heart that surrenders to Jesus as king and says, Jesus, be the king of my life. You get Jesus on the throne and you get his peace. And one day he will come back and he will bring peace on this world, on this earth, literally. You see, in order for peace to come, there has to be a removal of sin first. You can't have peace with sin. And that's why Jesus came to die for our sin, so that one day he can justly bring peace to each of our hearts today and one day into the whole world. See, without Jesus, we cannot and we will never have true peace and lasting peace. Jesus does not demand peace. He doesn't come in and enforce peace. He steps in and defeats the real problem for us, which is our sin. And that's why he paid the price on the cross. He had to die to defeat sin. And now those who make him king are forgiven and experience peace. Now, there are two real kinds of peace that we experience. There's the peace with God that comes when we repent of our sin and receive Christ. This is so important. This is first. We need peace with God. Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But here's the second kind of peace that we need. It's the peace of God that comes into our hearts as we surrender to Jesus daily as our king. I have peace with God, but every day I need to choose to receive the peace of God. I have peace with God by faith, by trusting Christ years ago as my Savior. My sins are washed away. But if I want to experience and walk in the peace of God, well, Philippians 4 puts it like this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. You guys, in the times we are living in, it's easy to let anxiety rule, but the peace of God changes us. It changes the way we see life, the way we interact with the world, the way we interact with people. When we have the peace of God, we can sense it, and even others can sense it, that this is a person who's walking in surpassing peace. That's what we can have because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Make him the king of your life, and you can walk in that peace. Come to the cross. That's how we make him king, is we bow down to him at the cross and say, wash away my sin. Here it is. I confess it to you, and he is the king of kings. Just in closing, let's look at verse 7. Just to emphasize the point, Isaiah says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Verse 7 adds to the certainty of Jesus' future reign on earth. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now, when you study that, you realize that in Zechariah and in Revelation, it's very clear Jesus will reign for 1,000 years on this earth. And that will happen. We'll call it the millennial kingdom or the millennial reign of Christ. But Jesus will not be limited to 1,000 years of reigning. There is a special 1,000-year period, but when those 1,000 years are up, that's just the beginning of Jesus' reign They will transcend into the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And verse 7 says there will be no end to Jesus' rule and the peace that his reign will bring. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. His peace will be everlasting and even increasing in wonder and glory forevermore. 
Where will he reign? It says there, upon the throne of David. That is in Jerusalem. What will that reign be like? He will order and establish it with judgment and justice. There are many more descriptions given in Old Testament prophecies, but here Isaiah describes Jesus' future reign on earth as order, not chaos, as justice, meaning an end to all oppression and injustice in the world. Oh, I can't wait for that. That's why we're looking for Jesus to come. That's why we're our hope, our blessed hope, as Titus 2 says, is to look up and say, Lord, is today the day? I don't know, but I'm ready, Lord, or I'm, I ask you to help me to be ready, to be walking with you and not living for myself. In conclusion, Jesus is the King of Kings. When they hung him on the cross, there was a sign above his head that read, King of the Jews. In Revelation, when he returns, his sign will be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And one day, his literal physical kingdom will come to the earth, and he will be known by everyone on this planet as Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. But the message here today is that Jesus can be all of those things in your life right now. There will be a day when everyone of those offices is imposed upon the world. But right now, Jesus says, I invite you to join the ranks of my people and enjoy these things today by faith. How do I enjoy Jesus as the wonderful one in my heart? Lord, I'm looking to you. First thing in the morning and throughout the day, my hope is in you. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Be filled up with the power of the Holy Spirit. Abide in Jesus. Rejoice in Jesus. As the old hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He's my wonderful Jesus. How do I enjoy him as my counselor? Well, seek him listen to him, and obey him. How do I enjoy him as mighty God? Just remember, even though the world is running against Christ, he's absolutely in control. He's still on the throne, and one day he will literally reign. Our hope is in him. How do I relate to him as the father of eternity, my father of eternity? You get all your source, all your life from Jesus. He's the source of eternal life, and he's our hope. How do I relate to Jesus as my Prince of Peace? Make peace with God through repentance of sin and walk in the peace of God as you let Jesus be your King. So, Father, thank you so much for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Truly, your name is above every name. And at your name, Lord, we are in awe. Thank you for all you have done, but also all you are doing and all you're going to do for us. Not that we deserve an ounce of it, but you love us. Lord, you demonstrate your love for us. In that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid it in full, and now you've come to live in us and walk with us. And so we crown you, Lord, as our king. We choose to put you first in our day. We choose to look to you and not to things of this world or people in this world. You are the one who inspires all. We choose to seek you in the word, to listen to you, to obey you. That's how we make you king and receive your counsel. And Lord, we choose to look at you as mighty God, as the father and, and source of all of our life. And Lord, you give us peace as we make you king. So help us walk in that peace. And as we look forward now toward a new year in only a few days' time, help us to set, Lord, spiritual goals that we hear from you, that you would whisper to our heart as we spend time with you, and that you would show us in how to walk ever more close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>